Dialoguing on South Asia, we explore the lives of its people, hear their stories and the histories of the land, discover its beauty, and encounter its conflicts, complexities, and harmonies in a search for liberty, peace, and prosperity. Interacting with leaders, activists, academics, and common folk from the South Asian sphere about their work and their passions, their dreams and their life journeys, their immigrant experiences, advocacy efforts, religion, politics, and so much more. With this, your host, journalist and author Peter Friedrich. Hand in hand, we meet and stand with South Asia. This is DOSA. Welcome to the show, uh, Pastor Ben Marsh. Thank you for joining, and uh, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm I'm doing really well. Happy to be with you, brother, and, and happy to chat about um, all things India and caste and all the things that might be on your mind today. This is great. Awesome. Well, I know that we talked a little bit before about what we intend to cover, but I, I'm seeing the Boba Fett helmet in the background there. So maybe we can redirect the conversation towards the topic of Eastern religion and as it appears and in, in influences Star Wars. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I, I, uh, I'm i a big Star Wars fan, um, have been since I was a little kid. Uh, I think there's uh, a great deal of Eastern influence in there. I think there's a lot of um, Jewish mysticism that's built into that. I think there's even Christological pictures that you can get out of it. So I've always loved it. But anything you see behind me, uh, you know, my wife designed the background. She said just a wall of books look terrible. So I had my Yoda up top. I've got my golden Darth Vader over here and Boba Fett. So, yeah, I'm exposed. Um but no, it's it's a it's a just a, a great series of entertainment and very, very rich uh, for anybody that wants to exegete uh, modern culture. It's a good place to start. Excellent. Well, no shame here. I've uh, got uh, my own my own um, fair share of, of geek culture that I'm into. Star Wars doesn't tend to be where I veer so heavily, but uh, I'm more of a Lord of the Rings guy but definitely have some uh, Star Wars Marvel fans uh, that are within my orbit and network. Awesome. So Ben or Pastor Ben. Um, Either one's fine. So so what's your deal? I, <clears throat> I see that you are an anti-identitarian Christianism uh, pastor. And that's a denomination that I'm actually not particularly familiar with. Maybe you could, <laughs> you could elucidate that and just, just uh, what is your deal? Yeah, so uh, that that's so funny. Uh, I'm part of the Christian Missionary Alliance, so if you want my denomination, that's the the real deal there. But uh, that phrase, anti-identitarian Christianism, uh, I got from Samuel Perry and some others online uh, who are sociologists looking into this kind of current movement of uh, people who are using Christian language and identity, but more uh, in the sense of building off of secular cultural milestones and uh, political milestones. So what I'm trying to do in everything that I do is separate what is really of Christ and of the church versus what is culture using um, Christian identity, Christian cultural, uh, you know, milestones or touch points to support what is really secular achievements or a secular culture. Um, you know, the biggest one that kind of started off this thought in my mind is like the whole thing about Starbucks uh, holiday cups versus, you know, Merry Christmas. I mean, you got Starbucks saying happy holidays versus Merry Christmas and people making a big deal about this. Well, if Christmas is really of the church, I, it, it doesn't really matter what, you know, secular capitalistic corporations are, are making as their centerpiece for the holiday season. It just, it just doesn't matter. It shouldn't be something that, that we care about. It certainly shouldn't be something living in a First Amendment country in America should care about. Let them say whatever they want. They're, so they sell so are, you, are you arguing then that the culture wars that are being fought in America, especially from my perspective over the past 10 to 20 years, are not actually the, the core uh, of the Christian faith? Yeah, I think they're a gigantic waste of time and money and really just lend themselves to political manipulation. Um, and to the feeling, this is what really bothers me as a pastor, to the feeling that you're doing something Christian that is actually something secular. 
but because you're using the word Christ or Christmas or whatever, you feel like and you get the approval of others around you as though you are doing something that is uniquely Christian when, when you're actually not. Well, and, you know, doing something Christian, feeling like you're doing something Christian when the end result is that you're actually creating this kind of hostility and this polarization, for instance, with the Starbucks issue. You, you know, it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's this giant secular corporation. So in, in, in a great sense, who cares what they do, under, especially under this First Amendment perspective? But at the same time, by hammering them for, for not using the terminology that you as a Christian think that they should use about uh, Christian season or Christian holiday, all you're ultimately ending up doing is is pushing them away and creating you're pushing them away and also i think you're giving a pass to uh the real question which is what does it mean for the church to be christian mm -hmm. i mean who, who cares if starbucks is christian what does it mean for the church to be uniquely christian and that's a question that just seems to be lost in the ether nowadays yeah, well, I have been very um, keenly aware of these culture war issues, especially over the past couple of years because of my own work. Uh, of course, as I say, the questions raised in the culture wars, whichever side you fall down on, are, are important questions. Um, although I think that the way that people place the level of importance on them in terms of of um, determining that they need to have political solutions rather mm -hmm. than just really uh, need to have uh, 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 settled answers uh, mm -hmm. is uh, certainly problematic. But it's especially drawn my attention because of my work, because my experience has been that with the American Christian Church on, on both sides of, of this culture wars debate, that very few of them uh, have time to pay attention to anything else beyond um, the the bickering back and forth at each other and the polarization of, of left versus right within the church in America, while there's so many pressing issues going on in the rest of the world outside of America beyond our borders, which are issues of, I would argue, far greater urgency issues, not just, of, you know, does, does Starbucks say happy holidays or Merry Christmas? Or, uh, you know, is this book banned in, in, a, in a library or not? Or uh, what, what have you? But issues of, of life and death, of, especially for the church, of not even being able to safely assemble up for Sunday service, which is something that we have basically not, never had to worry about, uh, by and large. Um, with some exceptions, depending on the issue, but they never had to worry about as Americans is can I safely go to Sunday service? Right. So you're a, you're a pastor, Ben. Um, you're based out of North Carolina. How long mm -hmm. have you been a pastor? What got you into it? Yeah, I've been a pastor for oh, almost about 20 years. Um, when I was coming out of college, I actually had a political science background, what to do and I really had no idea what I was going to do when I graduated college. Um, and my wife and I were invited to some family friends of hers. Uh, we were engaged at the time. We weren't married, but uh, we went to some family friends of hers where we heard a gentleman who uh, is a person of low caste background sharing his story of conversion. And uh, after he converted to becoming a Christian, he was and beaten. This gentleman uh, originated from India? Yeah, this story is in India. So the meal oh, that I was uh, having the, was, you was were, here. This happened in India. Yeah, but what happened to him was in India. I, I understand, yeah. Yeah, so he, he was sharing at a dinner in the States to do some fundraising and raise awareness. Um, but what he shared was about how he converted, was beaten by people in his, in his local village, was actually paraded through the town um, on an animal, some cattle, and... Uh, they mocked him, said, be like Jesus, be like Jesus, and, and actually threw acid on his face. His face had the acid uh, burns on it still. So he shared this story. And my thinking at the time was, well, I, I was going to do something in, in the nonprofit world and politics, whatever. And at that moment, really, you know, for the first time, discovered this issue of untouchability and the nexus of that with caste and the politics of India. And I was invited uh, by DFN to go out and um, visit India. This you know, was I'm, about when, 2003? 
Uh, yeah, this was 2003 that I, that I first went, 2003, 2004. Um, it so would have been in 04 because it was spring break. Woman, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, you met this gentleman, you said from a low caste background, was he, was he Dalit or, or, or a different? Uh, uh... I think he was Dalit. I, okay. I, I think, you know, in my recollection uh, that he himself was Dalit, he's, he's since passed. He was an older gentleman. In the haze of, in the haze of memory, do you recall where in India he was from? Uh he, he and his family uh, were from northern India, but I don't okay. remember which state um, particularly that his family was from. Um, I just remember being motivated, motivated by the story to say, yes, I'll go to India and came back from India so enchanted uh, with the idea of doing whatever I could do to help uh, people who across India were being um, shunted because of their caste status and because of their religious conversions. Um, of course, I became aware uh, of what was happening in Gujarat uh, at the time. Um, uh, and I, this is this is 2003, four that you went to India. Yeah, this is uh, how long did you go? 2004 is when I went to India. 2003 is when I met this guy. Okay, uh, and. So after I came back, that was my spring break, my kind of college senior year spring break. I came oh, back were you there said, for a couple of months in India or a few goodness, weeks. Goodness, no, a week, just a, a week. week. That's okay. all I had for spring break. Okay. Uh, but I came back and well, that's that beats summer, Miami Beach. Yeah, it did. in heat and in flavor. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. We were mainly in South India. We did some travel to the north, but boy, it was hot. And you come off that plane and they give you a hot cup of chai and you know, you're sharing a plate uh, of food. And that was one of the things, you know, we don't eat with our hands here. And here I am landing on a plane, sitting with uh, Dalit people, and everyone's eating with their hands. And your immediate thought as a Westerner is, well, I'm not gonna eat with my hands. And then you realize you're all sharing one plate as a symbol of oneness and yes. commonality. And I realized in that moment, no, there's a humility here, but also a respect that needs to come into play. And I gladly shared the delicious biryani. Um, Hyderabadi biryani is still something I can't find anywhere else in the world. Um, and so after that, I said, yes, I'll serve in any way that I can. Well, so, well, so let me, yeah, uh, you said you would serve in any way you can after that, but I just don't want it uh, to go yeah, uh, to pass unnoticed that actually eating with one's hands, um, aside from yes, uh, within the caste paradigm uh, represents this oneness that we, there is no caste between us, there is no untouchable, but it's also takes a lot of skill, a surprising <laughs> amount of skill. Versus, Especially with the biryani. <laughs> versus shoveling food in, in with a fork. Yeah, um, and it was spicy, so I had to coat everything in yogurt just to down it. Uh, and so I had these and very don't touch yellow your face afterwards until you've washed your <laughs> exactly. washed your hands. Very yellow yogurty fingers that I was dealing with after that. It's funny. <laughs> so after that, um, you said yes. Uh, you you would your heart was touched. You would be yeah. interested in serving. Yeah, and so the DFN said, "Great, we're going to send you and, to and what DC, is DFN? just to Dalit go. Freedom Network, uh, which." was an organization birthed out of um, partnerships with churches in India and the United States uh, to do a few different things. Uh, one was, you know, child sponsorships at the time was a big thing in American Christianity. So uh, it was doing child sponsorship for schools uh, that they were opening um, in uh, outcast, low caste areas. And, and um, that's that's where here in America, for instance, you can sign up for like twenty or fifty dollars a month. Exactly, and, and that will sponsor one child's education over there. Exactly, yeah, and that was all the rage in the early two thousands. Um, it was to do um, in the context of those schools and those communities where the schools were to do economic development. Um, Micro loans were becoming a very big thing. And so developing microloan programs and um, cooperative work environments, especially for women. Uh, and then uh, to do the political activism, uh, the social justice piece, which was what I was doing in Washington, DC, and they were doing on the ground in India. So to coordinate a partnership of raising awareness in the United States on behalf of uh, that community in India. So you graduated from University with this political science background, 
and then after you encountered um, this this Dalit or lower caste gentleman speaking in America about his conversion experience, you uh, got a chance to hook up with Dalit Freedom Network with DFN mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. go over there, mm -hmm. spend a little bit of time on the ground, and then come back and decide make the choice that you wanted to serve. And you ended up um, getting hired by DFN, uh, I believe, two thousand and four. Yeah, hired's a, a wonderful term. It, they were like, hey, we want you to do this. We have no money and we can't pay you. So <laughs> it was a self-funded <laughs> hiring. Uh, but I was so in love with the issue and, and just so desperately wanted to help in any way that I could. My wife was fortunate to work for the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So we were able to afford to live and work in D.C. as a result of that. Is that where you were from originally? No, um, from the Raleigh area, although I was I was born West Coast, I was raised a little bit in upstate New York. I'd lived in North Carolina uh, since I was uh, fourth grade. So whatever that is, nine years old. Well, I can imagine. I mean, I'm raised and brought up or the same thing, I guess, born and raised um, in the rural gold country of California and in the, in the foothills. So I'm a, I'm a country boy at heart. So I have a lot of things I enjoy in D.C., especially the museums, but uh, i tell you when I get out there to D.C., or I've been in uh, now New York City uh, probably a good three, four times in the past two months. Uh, still, uh, you could take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. <laughs> and it's still, I don't know about you, how you found D.C. when you got there, um, but, uh, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that. And, and then especially... Um, when you got there and you were focused on polit this political advocacy work uh, for for DFN, what sort of stuff did you do uh, from that perspective? Well, they were they were doing sponsorships, economic development, microloans, the cooperatives over in India. But what was the what was the need for the advocacy work, and, and what did you put your uh, hand to? Yeah, so DC boy, we we um, we fell in love in many ways. It. it it, one of the reasons why we'd eventually leave is we wanted to start a family. And I feel like one of the drawbacks of DC is it's a very challenging and expensive place to, to have a family. Um, and so that was kind of one of the long-term limitations, but as two young married people with no kids, it was great. You had culture, you had concerts. Um, I was able to connect with other people who are lobbyists in the religious freedom space. Uh, and at the time, uh, you know, during the, the Bush administration, there was just a lot of conservative Christian political activism of all stripes there. And so we were able to connect with people who were young adults like ourselves that were in the State Department, uh, in the White House, in, in uh, the halls of Congress. Um, one of the things that wasn't DFN specific, but which I was able to connect with was a uh, um, a congressional group of staffers, some people from state, some people from, from the White House, uh, that would meet monthly just to pray for the persecuted church. Uh, and it was fabulous. We'd get together, we'd grill up some food in someone's backyard, and, and we would pray. Uh, I got to coordinate with people that were working on issues of persecution in North Korea, uh, in China, uh, in uh, Sudan. Uh, in dealing with the civil war in Sudan at the time, there were a lot of connections that I was able to, to deal with. And I was partnered with, almost seconded to, an institute on religion and public policy uh, that ended up sending me to Sudan, to uh, Marrakesh, Morocco, to Bangladesh. Uh, and of course, I would go back to India. So I just, as a young adult, I mean, I had no money, but I got to do all this religious freedom advocacy work kind of all over the world. Um, it, it made my my visas and my passport quite questionable. I actually got stopped in Delhi one time trying to head home because I had been to Sudan, Morocco, and Bangladesh in short order, and it made me a little suspicious. Um, but it was captivating. It, it was um, heady, almost intoxicating, being able to go and, as somebody with no money and just fresh out of college, meet with political leaders all across the world. I um, I went to the swearing in of Jean Grang as the vice president of a newly united Sudan before he, he died in a helicopter accident shortly thereafter. Um, got to teach classes in Bangladesh on the importance of religious freedom. Uh, so it was it was kind of all over the place. It was just a fascinating time in my life that I that I thoroughly enjoyed. 
And particularly on the India front, what we tried to do was, um, and what I learned from other successful advocates in Washington, D.C., is try to leverage what little voice you have for maximal effect in news media uh, and in politics. So rather than come in and say, look, I'm going to solve all the problems in the world, it's say, what are the current avenues for, for sound, for noise, for, for advocacy to actually be heard and, and work within those channels? So what existed at the time were, um, of course, the, the um, Council for International Religious Freedom in the State Department. Uh, the State Department uh, had many people working in religious freedom. We have a U.S. ambassador for religious freedom. We have a U.S. Uh, segment of the State Department focused on trafficking, um, people working on child trafficking in particular, um, people working on justice issues in general. So what we began to do is work with different avenues within the State Department of the White House to elevate the issue of uh, caste and untouchability within the context of those reports. And so yeah. gradually they started to become more important to where India was actually identified uh, because of Gujarat and the pogrom there, identified as a major violator of international religious liberty, which they hadn't been identified um, before, uh, was identified uh, in new ways in the reports on trafficking, uh, in the reports on justice in general, um, all these kind of reports that come out of the State Department. And then you build on that. So we're able to take those reports to the Congress and say, hey, can we have a hearing on untouchability? And so we were able uh, to have yeah, once for the you, first once time you, ever. Once you've done all that groundwork to establish that foundation within the bureaucracy, right. the State Department, and not them coming out with all the reports, that gives you the stack of, of evidence to then go and, and do the second layer of advocacy directly to Congress. Yep. And then also to connect with that, with the bureaucracy within, you also connect with the uh, larger voices outside. So we worked with the Southern Baptist, um, you know, ethics uh, and religious liberty group. Um, at the time, Barrett Duke was there. And so we would meet with him. Uh, we would meet with the National Association of Evangelicals leadership. They put out a statement of conscience on uh, untouchability in India. And so you kind of are able to take all these disparate resources that are all factual they're all, you know, based in what's really going on on the ground in India. And we were able to actually get this hearing on untouchability and bring people from India over to speak to um, members of Congress, including a Dalit woman, which is huge given their status um, in, in, you know, in India culturally. When was this hearing? Um, uh, I want to say it was 2005 or six. I, I, I could give you, I could send you the, the actual sure, date. Sure, yeah, yeah, I mean, approximately. But uh, so this hearing, um, you were able to bring over uh, these people from India, including a Dalit woman. A um, mm -hmm. couple of questions. Um, would love to hear your perspective. Uh, one is, um, how do you feel that uh, now, from my understanding, this may have been uh, the only hearing that occurred um, on this specific issue, which is makes it historic and significant. So um, I'm curious, um, you know, somebody that was there, what kind of a, a turnout did you have, a reception did you have from the actual elected officials as far as members of Congress or their staff or that sort of thing that were participating? It was 2005, so I just looked it up, and the magnifying effect of this isn't the number of people in the room, because you never get a lot for a hearing unless it's on TV. Uh, whenever you see on TV all these 20 members sitting there listening to a hearing, I've been in many hearings and there's like three people in the room. It's like whatever is minimal to hold the hearing. Um, but the magnifying effect is that it, it made the news in India, front page news in some of the papers in India, and the church in India was able to uh, evidence this is, hey, we really care about what's going on with the people on the ground. Um, this matters to us. When we uh, try to treat Dalits with respect, when we go in and we share the gospel with people, when we live as Christians in the world, we're not rice bowl Christians. We're not trying to convert people just with money and with food. We actually have a genuine concern and care for for the people that we minister to. And just to, and, just to make note, that is a extremely common allegation raised against converts in India, yep. actually to most religions, but especially to Christianity, 
is that uh, the only reason they're converting is, is it's never out of conscience or sincere, genuine change in heart and belief. It's only ever because they were paid off. They right. were forced. They were they got economic incentives. They got a bag of rice that was enough to make them switch their religion and start going to church. Right. Um, that there's this general concept that's propagated in order to um, uh, advocate against religious freedom uh, and even mm -hmm. uh, advocate for implementation of laws which formally deny religious freedom, which uh, specifically um, has this uh, theory behind it that uh, genuine conversion just doesn't occur. Right. But, yeah. Right. So and we, at the time, we, yeah, you know, yeah. and I'm sure they're wrestling with it now. That's one of the reasons why they would advocate for these anti-conversion laws. And you have to pay a fee to show your conversion. You lose your caste status if you convert, you know, all this sort of. You, um, you, depending on the laws, you, you may have to actually go down to the local magistrate and inform them, get permission from them uh, formally, uh, undergo a waiting period, etc. Right. So um, we had this hearing and I've found the title, uh, India's Unfinished Agenda, Equality and Justice for the two million, 200 Million Victims of the Caste System. Um, the, the chairman, Chris Smith, um, who is the chairman of the subcommittee that hosted this, has always been an advocate on these issues. Uh, he's a great guy, Republican out of New Jersey. Yeah, I believe and, he may still be in office. Yeah, I think he is. Um, you know, it made, it made several Indian newspapers. Um, it made newspapers in the United States. Of course, there's big news in the in the American expat Indian community. Um, and that kind of coincided with the effort to uh, cancel the visa of Narendra Modi. Um, as so before the, uh, we get to that, I really mm -hmm. would love to talk with you about that because I know you were involved, but especially for uh, anybody listening who may not already be in the know, um, what exactly is is this uh, is the relevance you know in the 21st century of of talking about caste, talking about about Dalits, those formerly known as untouchables, uh, considering as far back as, as 1950 in the Indian Constitution, caste discrimination was banned, was outlawed. The practice of untouchability was 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 outlawed under the Indian Constitution. So hasn't this all been taken care of? Yeah, you'd think. Um, <laughs> of course, we as Americans should know very well the um, difference between words on paper and the law and what gets practiced in, in our courts and criminal justice system and on the ground. Um, the parallels to the United States uh, civil rights movement are, are very, I think, keen. Um, and, you know, what has been dealt with in India is actually older and even more culturally entrenched uh, in many ways than what the United States did as a relatively young country and certainly a younger culture than the Indian culture. Um, so I think it's wishful thinking on any of our parts if we ever were to think that words on a page would dictate what happens on the ground, particularly when you get into you know villages where um, police and local authorities can easily be paid off or related to the perpetrators of violence. Um, you know, it has ramifications in the United States. Uh, there are people that are killed in the United States because of, um, you know, marriages out of caste, high caste to untouchable or low caste. Um, there was instances of that. Uh, in even when I was in D.C. at the time, um, in Detroit, there were people that uh, were reporting that would happen because there's a large expat community there. Um, and I read of another case in Chicago where a person who was of an upper caste background uh, married a Christian person and there ended up being um, some abuse and I think either a murder or some criminal activity there. I don't remember the specifics. Um, but, you know, one of the realities is as the church, when we hear the words of Jesus, um, blessed are the poor, that, that has to mean something. And when we look at the activities of Christ on earth, in his specific and intentional love for people uh, who were cut off from the community, either because of disease or because of um, cultural um, boundaries that were drawn. Uh, when you look at the story of the Good Samaritan and the question resounds, who is my neighbor? Uh, I find that a big part of the answer to your question of why does this matter, why we do this is, do we have a consistent witness 
that what is wrong is wrong and what is right is right. And if we can't speak to an issue uh, like untouchability, and uh, if we can't speak to the injustice across the board that occurs as a result of that, whether it's legal or not, uh, even if it's just rooted in culture, if we can't speak to that, then what can we speak to? Um, what, what right do we have? What two legs do we have to stand on if we can't call evil, evil? Um, and at the time, there were a lot of young, um, active Christian evangelicals that held to that belief that we really could be politically active in a positive way across the aisles for people that were facing severe injustice. And, the, and, 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 I, and that the answer to who is my neighbor is, you know, uh, we go back and we read, actually read the story again. Uh, the answer to who is my neighbor uh, is not the, the always the person in the pew next to me who happens to share my theological and especially my political beliefs. And my cultural background. And my yeah. cultural background. That, right. that is not the answer. Right. So within within this uh, context of your work with, with DFN in uh, 2005, that would have been, I guess, probably only about a year or so into, into you uh, beginning with, with uh, DFN formally. Uh, you were uh, involved um, in helping to get um, Modi's uh, visa denied for travel to the U.S. Now, why? Wh wh who, who, who was Modi at the time, um, and why? Why were you interested in getting his 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 visa uh, denied for him to come here to the U uh, to the U.S. And what did that have with what did that have to do with the work being done at Dollar Freedom Network? Uh, so, you know, one of the realities of being an advocate is you're always working in network, right? So, uh, I, I this wasn't even my idea. I would never claim it to be my idea. I don't know whose idea it was. I, I can't remember which kind of nonprofit person or which person within the context of, uh, Congress or state came up with the idea, but, um, there was a law, there still is a law, a uh, significant law on religious freedom, uh, that was, uh, passed shortly before this time. Um, I, I can't remember if it was 2002 or 2003. I believe it was 98. What oh, was it, 98? Was that I, if I recall yeah. correctly, I, yeah. And one of the kind of unused and hasn't really been used much since um, parts of this law was that people who have been identified as severe violators of religious freedom could have their uh, visa revoked specifically for that reason, even if there was no other cause for their visa to be denied or revoked, if they were a severe violator of religious freedom, uh, that they, they could have their, their visa revoked. And so we uh, started to advocate within the State Department. And again, at the time, you had a lot of really great, young, sharp minds that were advocating within the State Department already. And so having outside voices like the Southern Baptists, like uh, the NAE, um, uh, you know, voices from Congress lobbying as well, uh, the State Department um, denied his visa. He was coming to speak at a hoteliers association. A lot of hotels in, in the United States. Yeah. A lot of hotels in the United States are, are owned by Indian Americans or by Indian expats. And it's a very, very big deal. Um, and the reason why they denied it is the United States said that as head of the state uh, government in Gujarat, between February and May in 2002, that he was the one responsible for the performance of state institutions, in particularly withholding uh, police during uh, violence in Gujarat in that period of time. It was a comprehensive failure. This is a quote, comprehensive failure on the part of the state government to control the persistent violations of rights to life, liberty, equality, and dignity of the people of the state. And so it was, it was a big deal. I mean, this, of course, made massive waves uh, over in India. Uh, it made some significant waves here in the United States. Um, was, it a, was it a difficult thing to achieve? You know, because I wasn't part of the internal conversations in the State Department, I don't know. But if I were to guess, I would say it was because partnership with India was a significant uh, motion within the context of the Bush administration. And this was actually right around the exact same time as the U.S.-India India nuclear deal was being pushed through 
Yeah, yeah. you have the, the nuke deal. You have uh, anti-terrorist activities, um, you know, in, in the constraint of uh, terrorism in Pakistan, northern India and, and um, you know, Bangladesh and other parts in South Asia. Uh, you, you have the economic ties are becoming increasingly important as uh, there's the outsourcing going on, um, you know, call centers, tech centers, things like that are being outsourced at the time. Um, so this was this was massive for somebody who's part of one of India's major political parties, um, a, an up and coming leader. I think in retrospect, it was probably a, a, a misfire or a backfire in the sense that it elevated his position in the eyes of many uh, Indians yeah. in India, probably got him money that he never would have gotten before in support uh, from people in the United States. And because of technology, he was still able to show up and speak uh, over the Internet uh, at that conference of hoteliers. That's a very interesting point. Um, I've never actually heard that. It, it, a lot of... A lot, uh, in that, that does seem to make some sense. Um, of course, in retrospect, we, we never actually know uh, mm -hmm. because it didn't happen. But that's something interesting to consider: is if that if that ban hadn't been pushed through, would it have elevated uh, Modi to the status that uh, this this cult status? Would he have uh, continued to to rise, or or would uh, it have allowed things to kind of just ripple away and and they the bjp over there uh, or their supporters here maybe would have turned their attention to somebody somebody else uh, somebody that might have been maybe ultimately a little bit less of a uh, problematic problematic personage interesting point you know it's it, it, there's some significant i think parallels with you know people puzzle over every time donald trump gets indicted it seems like his polling numbers have gone up over the last you know three months and I think there's significant parallels there. And I, I think that you have to take a realistic assessment of um, how do people that are able to capture a cultural identity, uh, able to grow amongst their followers and even attract more fans, the more that they're hated. Well, the reality is, is um, you know, if, if somebody is hated by somebody that I hate, then now I'm interested in them. Now I'm curious about them. Now I want to know more. Why, why do these other people, you know, um, why did American Christian, you know, uh, conservative evangelical people uh, ban Modi from coming over to, to it, um, America? We don't like those Christians uh, as the BJP. We're tired of seeing conversions happen. And now all of a sudden we're going to elevate Modi to this kind of centerpiece of, of our whole political and sociological and even religious movement. Um, it, it was, I think it was, it was a misfire in that regard or a backfire in, in that regard in retrospect. One of the but quandaries of, course, of yeah. advocacy is, is, you know, if, as you're trying to draw attention to the issue, you know, does, is, is it possible that the, if you do manage and succeed in drawing large amounts of attention to the issue and achieving what seems to be a victory even, is that down the road going to actually result in unintended consequences? Big, big, big question. I mean, huge, huge question. And it's it's one that you, you you can't know the future. So you think you're doing the right thing at the time. I certainly felt like we were doing the right thing at the time. We wrote in support of this effort. Um, but it was just, um, I think, in the end, something that, that might have fanned the flames, uh, especially for the extremism uh, and the far wings, you know, the RSS and others that support Modi's work in India. Well, so that was 2005, and and when did you leave uh, uh, Dala Freedom Network, and what route did you what pulled you away? Well, I, I ended up being called into the pastoral ministry. I, I started seminary in part because I I wanted to actually continue work in the nonprofit world, um, but my wife and I were were thinking of having a family, and and then when she got pregnant, we realized that you know. It was going to be very difficult to raise funds, have a family, and do all the work that we wanted to do in D.C. at the time. So my heart remained there, something I always wanted to go back. Um, there was also some, within the context of the organization, um, some internal conflicts. Uh, there were some accusations of mismanagement. A lot of that I was not privy to. I mean, I was very low man on the totem pole. I wasn't in any kind of C-suite leadership position. Um, but it was sufficient for me as a young man to say, I'm in over my head. I need to have more experience in the world. I need to not just be um, a pawn that kind of, you know, goes from one part of the chessboard to the other. Uh, I need to be able to take a step back and, and really evaluate, you know, what do I believe and how do I accomplish what I believe? 
And so I went back to seminary and during the course of seminary, felt a call to ministry, uh, was hired back at the church where I grew up actually, and was there for 15 years. And, and now I've been a lead pastor where I'm for five. Um, and so I could see myself going back into this world. Um, I, I love speaking on, talking about, advocating in, the, in issues of justice. At present, I work uh, on a nonprofit board. I'm, I'm the chair of a board uh, for an organization called Monarch that provides mental health services in the state of North Carolina. We're one of North Carolina's largest providers in that area. Uh, so I've loved the nonprofit world and I love the advocacy world. It's something I'll never leave. And definitely one day, you know, if God frees me, and says, go, I'd, I'd love to go back and advocate, whether it's the, the issue of Dalits, religious freedom, or there's some other issue that God might have for me. Um, always have kept that in my heart. Well, I know for a fact that uh, things in India have only gotten a lot worse uh, yes. since you you left in, uh, in 2007, right? 2007? Yeah, it got, got a lot worse since I've left, but I don't think my leaving had anything to do with that. <laughs> we, we, we could hope and pray that's the truth. And and, and I, I I think, yeah, uh, you know, um, that probably had, had little to do with it. But um, things have gotten a lot worse uh, yep. since since you uh, departed uh, this work. Um now, when you were when you were there and you were engaging with the uh, U.S. government, U.S. Congress, and the, bu the bureaucracies uh, behind the scenes as well, from what I've seen, uh, the history of, of what happened there, not just with your work, but with other advocacy organizations that were there on the Hill uh, talking about human rights issues, religious freedom issues in India at the time, back in 2000, early 2000s, 2005, 2007, there were some significant issues, you know, as we discussed the issue of castes and and and, and um, Dalit civil rights. Um, there were also issues, of course, two thousand and two uh, Modi and Gujarat, but Gujarat at the time was was just one of one of uh, I think it was then twenty nine uh, states in India, and just one of the states, Modi uh, and his party didn't hold national power, mm -hmm. and yet. We still saw the U.S. government, both elected and, and uh, the uh, civil service, paying a fairly large amount of attention uh, to what was going on in India um, and being willing, actually, to generally uh, publicly uh, speak about what was going on in India. I, I know that uh, there were quite a number of members of Congress who would often actually take the floor of the House on a fairly mm -hmm. regular basis and raise yep. these issues. Um, we we saw resolutions um, um, coming up uh, in in Congress. I believe there was at the time. I don't know if it was during your tenure, but I believe I recall one specifically about caste uh, within that same era mm -hmm. or general era. So, what do you think has really shifted then since then? Because this was a time when the U.S. government was willing to talk publicly about these issues, but things were were probably like 10 percent of the bad or less that they are now. Mm -hmm. Now, as things have gotten radically worse over the past, what is it, 14 years, mm -hmm. uh, 15 years, the uh, number of folks over there in our government, whether it is elected or unelected, that are willing to uh, even touch these issues, let alone... Mm -hmm consistently speak publicly about them is reached practically zero. Thank God, not entirely zero, but especially within the the sphere of, of electeds. Um, it's it's bottom of the barrel compared to what it was, what it was then. Why, why do you think that is? Well, I think that a big part of that is, is leadership. Um, I think that within the context of the Bush administration, there were significant conservative voices who had a justice bent, particularly when it comes to international justice. Uh, the church, the Evangelical Church in America, was also starting to broaden its understanding of what it meant to live justly in the world. And so you had a, a group of both more seasoned politicians and then also these novices like myself who really felt like there was an open door to bringing the ideas of justice, human rights, um, uh, religious freedom, and all these sorts of things into the American governmental machine, particularly in international relations. Uh, American international relations, for most of its existence, has been dominated by a kind of um, 
uh, politics of necessity, uh, by a real politic, by uh, the sense of we're going to do whatever it takes to ensure American economic stability and, and American economic success internationally and to prevent the loss of American lives um, and business. And there was this narrow window, and occasionally in American politics, there are these narrow windows where it seems like, no, maybe we can accomplish more. Maybe we can bring some sense of justice and peace into other countries. Uh, and then those windows close. And so I think that's what we had, is we had this narrow window where you had a, a set of leaders in the Congress, in the White House, in the State Department in particular, that were willing to advocate for and really do politics according to a sense of right and wrong that wasn't just kind of reduced to um, international security concerns or to international American economic interests. And um, not to, you know, certainly from my, my end, not to offer any defense of, of uh, Bush whatsoever, but within the, that context, the, do you think that the reason for that was because of him and his administration that they were packing out these positions with these types of international justice people who were willing to look beyond the pragmatic and, and focus more on the principle? Yes, I actually do believe that because I knew a lot of them at the time. These are people that have gone on out of the State Department to work at, um, you know, some significant uh, nonprofits across the globe. Um, you know, uh, people that I worked with at the time in the Congress and in the State Department are now people that work all over the world. I mean, there's friends of mine that I that I had at the time that I follow on online that are working on uh, human rights issues in Ukraine now with, with the war in Ukraine, um, people that are working uh, at International Justice Mission, people are working, I mean, just all, kind of all over the map. Everybody kind of spread and went to the four winds. Um, but they are people that had genuine, personal, even faith-based conviction that justice was an issue that had to be dealt with. And um, again, there's all sorts of things that you can say negatively about Bush, and I would rally behind all of them. But one thing that he did do was tap a talent pool of people uh, in international relations that didn't just have as their focus uh, the constraint of, you know, real power and economic interest. There, there were some justice issues that really started to come to the fore and, and gain significant focus. And it's not to say that that changed completely under the Obama administration, but one thing that changed that I noticed as I was kind of headed out the door um, was one, you have all the turnover, so you lose the institutional knowledge after eight years of, of power. But but two, and, and you, you had- were, a, You were headed out the door leaving DFN just as Obama was coming in. Right, right just as the, all this kind of change went over. But the other thing that, that happened that was significant was um, the renewed interest on uh, the geopolitical problem of China. And India suddenly became this major player in how do we constrain China in Asia? And I think that that reduced the interest in America uh, on focusing on the human rights issues that were on the ground in India and elsewhere in, in South Asia. And the other thing that happened too was, was a real focus on, um, on counterterrorism in Pakistan uh, and India became a major partner in constraining terrorism that was arising out of Pakistan. And those two things combined with over the last you know decade and a half the ongoing wars in iraq and afghanistan um you know the in the last six years the the rise of kind of russia as this um cyber attack oriented kind of strategic you know elections meddling all this sort of stuff we're, we're almost back into this kind of cold war mentality of viewing everything through the lens of well how does this secure uh american uh, national strategic interests, how, not I mean, how can we pull this string and pull that string in order to maintain the balance of power all around the exactly. world. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, and that's the mindset, it, at least in my assessment of, of the last, you know, couple administrations among, in both parties um, and in the Congress, and much less so the, the, the narrow window of this kind of social justice um, heartbeat that was happening. And, and I think part of it too, um, just to be frank, is that during the Bush administration, they had this genuine belief that uh, not only was it good to do these justice issues as justice issues, but also this was part of their counterterrorism strategy, which is if you can support 
malign communities across the globe, give them a uh, real voice and make sure that they're not continually repressed, restrained, uh, economically devastated, et cetera, you can prevent the spread of uh, terrorism amongst the impoverished peoples of the globe. So there is a counterterrorism piece of that. And I think that part has also gotten lost in many ways. The whole idea of, of economic development as a counterterrorism strategy is just not something that's discussed that, that I've seen, at least as much in international relations circles as it was in the Bush administration. So there's this unique nexus of people that were just as minded, and then also people that worked in counterterrorism and international relations that saw those justice movements, if they were economically based, if they were um, positively done, you know, not not negative as in we're going to tear down the crown and kill the king, but positively done in a sense of we want to help people, uh, that those could be effective counterterrorism stability oriented kind of motions. Well, speaking as a pastor, um, and you know, I, I especially appreciate uh, your your perspective uh, conversation on all of this because you are able to also speak from this informed uh, political science perspective. But as a, as a pastor, um, you know, I know you haven't been uh, from what you've told me following as closely what's happening in India today, but you're aware of uh, how well back then when Modi's visa was stripped away that was because of this 2002 pogrom which was targeted against Muslims um and uh since 2014 when Modi came to power for for a long time the some of the primary targets of violence were were Indian Muslims um but Christians increasingly uh, have become uh, particular targets of, mm -hmm. of, of violence by this internationalist movement especially or i would say over the past couple of years and um i've sat down over the past year and a half or so with uh, quite a number of of clergy members um who generally i'm introduced to them by members of the indian american diaspora who ask them to meet me and, and talk with me about what's happening to christians in india and i've sat down for coffee or lunch for for an hour or a couple of hours um usually one-on-one -on -one. and tried to discuss with them what's happening. And my experience is the one uh, speaking, you know, outside of the outside of the political realm, you know, off off the off the hill, um, but within the religious arena of the Christian faith throughout the US, my experience is that most of these clergy, one, have no idea that any persecution is happening at all, let alone two, know how severe it is. And right. It oftentimes takes me about an hour and a half to really kind of convey the point, what's happening, why it's happening, how bad it is, uh, who's doing it, et cetera, et cetera. But I distinctly recall one conversation over lunch I had with an uh, uh, elderly clergy member, um, who, a very sharp guy, who uh, after the, about an hour and a half in, I thought I conveyed the point. And he finally gets around to asking me, so what does persecution of Christians in India actually look like? And he starts asking, does it look like job discrimination, uh, you know, economic boycotting, housing discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought I'd already made the point 90 minutes into the conversation. But I'm like, well, yes, you know, that's part of the package, but that's not the worst of it. That's not the stuff that's of major concern for the global church what what happens is your know, sunday service you have a mob of 50 or 100 or 250 or 500 people usually armed oftentimes with the police accompanying them assemble outside of a uh, sanctuary during sunday services they bust into the sanctuary they start smashing it up they start beating everybody up they drag their clergy and the congregants outside if the yep. police aren't already there. Then the mob hauls the clergy and the congregants down to the police station to hand them in. And the police file charges against the Christian victims, not against the, the, the perpetrators, the persecutors. And this gentleman that I was having lunch with, it was like a light bulb finally went off in his head. And he's like, oh, like, like, like the Nazis? And I'm like, yes, exactly. But just like the Nazis. Just That's like it. the Nazis. Thank yeah. you. And he finally got the point. But unfortunately, he and actually 99% of everybody that I've spent hours uh, over coffee, over lunch with, as far as clergy members or church leaders, 
as a as an end result of of this time spent and educating them, informing them about this, the, you never hear back from them again. Um, yep. And uh, there's there's never any follow up. There's never any 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 interest in okay, well, what can I do? Um, you know, I would love to hear from you as a, as a pastor. Um, why why do you think there is? Because what from from what I'm seeing, there's there's both the ignorance, mm-hmm. broad broad ignorance in the in the, in the American church about what's happening in India. And I'm very familiar with. I, I grew up with with uh, stories of Corey Ten Boom, yep. stories of of um, Bibles being smuggled uh, behind the Iron Curtain, stories of persecution of the of the church the underground church in china etc cetera, etc cetera, all of this um that's the sort of church environment i grew up in um and which was seemed to be from my experience to be rather rather broadly um uh the the interest uh within within the church even outside of my own it was was an interest in the persecuted church and an awareness of it mm-hmm. the day that i what i'm seeing is in the american church this broad ignorance about what's happening in india and then also what strikes me as a pretty deep level of apathy. Yeah. What, why do you think that is? And what do you think can be done about it, if anything? Well, the second question, I think, is is a little bit easier to answer than the first. The first is actually, I think, has so much to do with um, technology, with the changes for the American church. And I'll come back to that. I think, I think the second thing, what do we do about that, is what pastors, what people in general are looking for is just to be told, do X. This is the one thing that you need to do. Uh, If you do this, you know, if um, I don't know if you've ever been signed up for uh, election emails um, from these politicians, but one prank that uh, my I, friends I try are, to hit the unsubscribe button. Yeah, as soon but, as you yeah, get it. But it's always you know, the world is ending today unless you press this button and give $23. And the most amazing and mind boggling thing about that is that it works. These things, you know, these guys bring in tons of small dollar donations. Um, the reason why the child sponsorship thing worked, even though I, I, in retrospect, I don't think it was the best model and it was rife with abuse all across the globe it worked because somebody could say, I'm doing a thing to help this problem. And so the work of raising awareness, here's the problem. Uh, people don't like living in that space. They don't like living in that, that uh, okay, I got a problem, but I can't solve it. Nobody likes to just have a problem sit on their chest. Uh, they want to know, what's the one thing I can do? You know, I can, I can throw my Coca-Cola can in the recycling and that's going to help the environment. You know, I can, I can, I uh, can, uh, bike to work, and that's going to, you know, uh, reduce carbon emissions, whatever. They, they want to know the thing. And so if you arrive at, or advocates can arrive at a clear sense of press X to solve Y, even though we know that's not how the real world works, at the very least for the people we're appealing to, it allows them to feel like they're addressing the issue that you've raised to them. Now, why that has to happen is because one, attention spans are shorter, because of technology. I mean, this is just like verifiable scientific stuff right now. People aren't paying attention. Uh, but two, I think within the context of the American church, um, churches are either becoming mega churches or tiny churches are disappearing. And the missiological work of sending a missionary to a foreign country and then having them come back and report or reading magazines about missionaries where you would read about this kind of persecution and have a prayer list that you would subscribe to does not happen the way that it happened for probably a hundred years in the American church or at the very least 80 years. And so you, you don't have, you know, somebody who has, uh, been trying to do church planting in villages in India coming back and saying, hey, we planted a church and then it got burnt down. And, you know, here's what you need to do is you need to call your representative and tell them, you know, tell India to stop burning down churches. Because you don't have that reputable source of proximate information, a missionary that you have personally supported to go overseas, church is now a platform, a stage, a screen, 10,000 people, you know, it's not the relationship one-on-one that you had with your pastor or with your missionaries or whomever before. 
uh, all of a sudden that information isn't reaching your ears. And we know it's not on CNN, it's not on MSNBC, it's not on Fox News, it's, it's not in the major media that they're consuming. So if it's not coming through the church, through somebody that's on the ground that you trust, you just, you're literally not hearing it. And so the barrier to hearing it uh, when you come along, when I come along, when somebody outside of your church space begins to share. Um, man, when I was in India uh, in 2005, I think, I went around uh, with Cademan's Call, a major wow. Christian band, and we recorded an album, Share the Well. And so I could just... I remember that song. Yeah, great song, great I didn't album. know you were involved with that. Well, I wasn't hugely involved, but I was kind of like a little bit of a guide for, for part of their trip to India. And I got to hang out with them for a few nights. Um, and they went to, I think they went to Ecuador and some other countries as well. But, uh, you know, that kind of thing, man, you got a band, every concert they're sharing about this. They have speakers from India come speak. You know, all of a sudden the awareness is, is super high through the roof. Um, and, but the final piece to this, too, that I think has to do more with the Church of America than anything going on, even with our information channels or anything, is that a lot of people that I know in the millennial and younger generation who have a heartbeat for social justice have flamed out of the church. Uh, they have deconstructed out of the church. They have had their eyes open to the abuses of the church, so and I'm, they no I'm longer... Just uh, I want to, if you can, yeah, go ahead. In and uh, the continuation of that thought, I just want to like note as I'm very aware of this deconstruction movement. You know, like like you said, a lot of these young people who have mm -hmm. a heart for social justice, those are exactly the sorts of people that would be the 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 vanguard of any type of Absolutely. involvement in in a potential movement like this to raise awareness, for instance, about the persecuted church in India. So yeah, one, one million percent. So. You know, in, unless you have um, somebody that they look up to, that crowd looks up to, you know, unless you have um, Sutran Stevens stands up and does a, you know, concert and then he says, hey, we're going to focus on India or Taylor Swift, you know, ends her concert with the uh, Christian men's used to do like a 30 minute sermon at the end of their of their concert set and, you know, share the gospel or call for a response. You know, unless Taylor Swift does that at Madison Square Garden. It's just not going to get into the ears of younger people that by and large aren't going to church anymore. So even if you're able to penetrate the church, um, the church is shrinking in America and there's fewer young people that have a justice heartbeat in the church. So you, you have a smaller audience and that audience is largely comprised of people who don't view the world through the lens of I can do something to change the world for good uh, in the sense of you know social justice. So I think it's it's a it's a man it's it's like a dwindling fire that's that's being stamped on and poured on and you know that whole notion of we can do good in the world uh, we can help persecuted Christians across the globe it's just shrinking that whole mindset is shrinking yeah and it's really disheartening for myself when I look at that fire and that passion that burning in the soul that is present for some people like for instance i just saw the the headline a couple of days ago i believe in ohio uh supporters of of trump for president and supporters of of ron DeSantis for president uh got in a bar fight right uh, at at uh, 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 uh as they were hanging out um in the day or whatever before uh trump and DeSantis were supposed to both be in town for the same event right and so right. there's there is that burning in the soul that drives people to young people to to be so passionately supportive of a cause like let's elect trump or let's elect DeSantis or let's elect x or y or z to the to the point that they'll even get up in a bar fight with the right. you know, supporters yeah. of the of the opposite team, and yet when it comes to to issues that really matter, um, and really actually do make a real world difference, not not to say that who's president uh, doesn't matter, but when it when it comes to issues like like this, especially for the for the Christian Church, we, I, I I've not seen that fire uh, in the soul in. Pretty much anybody that I've encountered, um, certainly old, but um, generally also also young as well. Yeah, I, I see it for other issues, but not for not for a lot of these issues that matter, and not just India, but but other issues related to the faith. Yeah, and I I think that it's um, I think that it's magnified too by the fact that the church in America 
shrank that question down. That question I told you about, somebody wants to see a problem and have an answer. They shrank the answer to go vote for this person. And so even people that are justice minded on both sides of the aisle that I've encountered um, find their only outlet for their advocacy is electoral and partisan in nature. And that is so disastrous when compared to the biblical record, when compared to the work of the gospel and the life of the believer, that it, it, it just robs us of our efficacy in doing any kind of good in the world. If we, if we reduce our impact in the world to what we do at the ballot box, man, I mean, we might as well just crawl in a cave for the, the other you know, 11 months out of the year. But it's, it's what I see happening. Uh, to do justice, to walk uprightly, to to love the widow and the orphan, if if all that means is vote, I mean, what it just, I mean, the church is is done for if that's what that boils down to. But that's what I see. I mean, what is the question people ask you? It's not, you know, what what is your impact on the world, your community? How are you loving your neighbor? The question is, who'd you vote for? Who'd you vote for? Who'd you vote for? It's madness. It's absolute and, madness. And the answer to that question it. determines whether or not I'm going to even continue speaking with you. Yeah, whether whether your view of the world even matters, whether your words will even reach my ears. And it's it's just, um, it, it's so destructive to the soul and it's destructive to the life of the church, but it's it's just the reality. That's the question that seems to matter more than anything right now. Well, I feel like, uh, you know, now it's not this conversation is not, of course, even necessarily the time for the solutions, but I feel like we spent a lot of time discussing the problem, uh, which um, I think has been enlightening, actually. And I think the first step to finding a solution is identifying the problem. Um, I, I think that's been really uh, cogent, um, insightful, what you what you offered there. And it, it really is disastrous that here in in america whether as, as just broad american citizens or i agree uh, i think uh, from my experience especially also in the church um which is typically focused on making a difference in the world um that the the how of making a difference in the world has been boiled down to nothing more than just hit that voting button for right this party or for that party or for and that stands in contrast to what I know of, of so much of Christian history, where uh, making a difference in the world, you know, we look, for instance, at uh, Christians that, that went out and uh, went to uh, to that what were them foreign lands. And for them, that oftentimes meant you, you, you had to learn the language, you had to go uh, 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 to that land, immerse yourself in, with the culture, live with the people completely, eat the food that they ate. You right. know, if, if it's far out in the jungle, you live far out in the jungle and in, in the same mud house that, that the local people live in. And that that's, that's, and you do that for years at a time. Maybe you do that for your entire life. Maybe you right. die there. Right. And that that's the sort of making a difference in, in the world type of tactic um, that has been employed historically by the church for so so very long so right. and so very disappointing that so i don't know what the solution has been um, <laughs> um but you know as we as we come to a close of, of, of this current conversation um our first and hopefully first of of more to come sure um what what thoughts do you have? Uh, final thoughts do you have? And do you have any solution uh, on hand? Because I'm certainly looking <laughs> for one myself. Yeah, uh, I think when it comes to the particular situation in India, um, I think that the the first and best thing that we can do is try to create a tangible redeeming relationship between Christians in India and Christians in the United States so that we can create an identity that transcends national or partisan boundaries. Um, this is one of the problems in the United States, of course, is that uh, Republican Christians don't think Democratic Christians are Christians, and you know it's a big deal. So we have to find a way to create a Christian identity and cling to a Christian identity that transcends partisan boundaries in the United States. But I think actually an international one is easier in some ways. It's probably easier for our American Christians of both political persuasions to look at Indian Christians and view them as Christians than it is to view their neighbor down the road here. Um, so I think that, you know, the beginning of healing, you know, this current disconnect with the persecuted church globally is that churches here 
need to be able to have Christians that they can speak with. Zoom calls, um, visits, uh, vision trips. Um, I just came back from a trip to Thailand where I was able to visit with Thai um, pastors on the ground there and hear their perspective. I was actually able to meet with some people that uh, work in Laos that are entering in the country and preaching the gospel illegally. You know, Laos has a, a massive problem like India does. Um, so the more that we can create those tangible, concrete relationships with churches and institutions in America, I think the, the, the better off we can be long term in raising the overall level of awareness um, that uh, people will begin to listen. Um, you know, it sounds silly, but wh why can't a guy like Steve Furtick, you know, stand up in front of Elevation Church and be like, hey, I'm going to show you guys a video of what happened to a church in India, and we're going to go rebuild this church. We're going to go, you know, I mean, if you could do that, or you could get a pastor, I mean, they got the money, goodness knows, you get a pastor. They have the uh, audience too. They have the audience, you get a pastor from India that comes over and stands on the stage in Charlotte, you know, and gets translated and shares their, their story of what they're facing over there. And can you help us, you know, asks right then, can you help us? That, that creates the, the momentum more than, than you or I as, you know, gringos, Americans, you know, I mean, we just don't have the cachet and we're not Indian. We're not living the experience that they're Indian, that they're living over there. And, and I think that kind of connects back to the, the bigger piece of how do we as, as a church uh, in America, um, begin to heal some of these partisan divides, begin to assess. Um, we have to speak truth, but we have to live in people's lives. And I think the second part is the thing that people struggle with more than the first. Uh, absent relationship, our words just don't matter. Um, my mentor in the ministry, uh, who just went to be with the Lord, um, Mitchell Gregory, he taught me the first rule of preaching is that people don't care what you have to say until they know that you love them. And so if you get up in front of a church where, that you, you obviously despise and you try to preach to them, people will see that through that veneer and you'll be kicked out the next day. And I think that that's the reality of, of loving our neighbor in America is that we want to speak truth without loving. I know that's a struggle for myself and many others, uh, but we have to find a way to reclaim a relationship. As I recall if you speak the truth without love, then it's like you're clanging cymbal. That's right. <laughs> you're, you're just walking around with a gong strapped to your back. So um, I think that relationship is the key. And uh, we have to find ways creatively of, of establishing those relationships here. That, that's the American problem. But going back to the, to, to the India thing, um, we, have to, we have to hear from people that we have a relationship with. And so cultivating those relationships is what's going to build an audience to be able to understand what's really going on with the persecuted church there. Well, Pastor Ben Marsh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, to hear your thoughts, and to work on cultivating a relationship uh, right here today. Um, and hopefully uh, this, uh, this message, um, this conversation gets out to some people. And once again, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, brother. It was great talking with you. Thank you for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please remember to subscribe and follow for more to come as we look forward to dialoguing once again on DOSA.